So hi everybody, um, welcome to the this event named uh, the, the uh, transformation of U.S. Iran relations in the wake of the Arab Spring. And tonight we have four panelists, and we have Dr. Marvin Zanis, who's actually going to start off with our introduction. And he is a professor at the Booth School here at the University of Chicago, and he is an expert in U.S. Iran relations. He's written on uh, the oil industry, U.S. Uh, Russia, and uh, Iran extensively, and so he's going to begin our evening discussion with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what I want to talk about is, uh, my title of my talk tonight is Iran Hysteria, and the point I want to make is that it's feeling very much like 2002 all over again, except this time it's Iran instead of Iraq, and I am very nervous about the buildup uh, to a military attack on Iran. For example, on November 14th, a couple of weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal published an editorial. It was called, quote, if Iran gets the bomb, close quote. And the editorial concluded, quote, the question for the world, and especially for the Obama administration, is whether those dire consequences are worse than the risks of a preemptive strike. We think we know what the Israelis will decide, especially if they conclude that President Obama stays on his current course. Opponents of a preemptive strike say it would do no more than delay Iran's programs for a few years. But something similar was said after Israel's strike on Iraq's Osirak reaction, reactor in 1981, without which the United States could never have stood up to Saddam after his invasion of Kuwait. In life as in politics, nothing is forever. But a strike that sets Iran's nuclear program back by several years at least offers the opportunity for Iran's democratic forces to topple the regime without risking a wider conflagration. Footnote, I don't know what the connection is between an American attack on Iran, the opposition having it without risking further. I don't get that one at all. No U.S. Pre to continue with the editorial, no U.S. president could undertake a strike on Iran except as a last resort. And Mr. Obama can fairly say that he has given every resort short of war an honest try. At the same time, no U.S. president should leave his successor with the catastrophe that would be a nuclear Iran. A nuclear run on Mr. Obama's watch would be fatal to more than his legacy, close quote. The obviously obvious implication of this editorial is that Obama's legacy will begin on January 21st, 2013, after he loses the November presidential election. So the window that Obama has is only between now and January 21, 19, uh, 2013. Uh, if you go back to the Republican candidate's foreign policy debate, which was held on November 22nd, uh, Newt Gingrich called for the United States to bring about regime change in Iran in the next year, again, another Obama deadline, uh, and also to go about sabotaging Iran's refining capabilities. Further, a man named Jamshid Chokri whom I have not heard of before, had an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. And Chokri, by the way, is identified as a professor of Iranian studies at Indiana University. And this professor of Iranian studies proposes an air campaign against Iran. So I went to the Indy University website to find out who this Jamshi Chokri was. He is identified on the website as and listen to this. Professor Central Eurasian Studies, Professor History, Professor Ancient Studies, Professor Indian Studies, Professor Medieval Studies, Professor Middle Eastern Studies, Professor Islamic Studies. Is this guy amazing or what? <laughs> Adjunct Professor of Religious Studies. But you'll be happy to know in this room that nobody identifies him on the website as a professor of Iranian studies. But the Wall Street Journal does. So in any case, 
Um, he's very impressive, but he's not a professor of Iranian studies. And he says in this op-ed, listen to this quote, the real goal of airstrikes should not only be to target Iran's nuclear facilities, but to cripple the Ayatollah's ability to protect themselves from popular overthrows. Western airstrikes should hit other military production facilities. Thanks. And the bases of the IRGC and the Basij, a foreign takedown of those enforcers would give Iran's population the opportunity to rise again. The IRGC's claim that it can retaliate significantly are largely bluster. The Iranian Navy's fast boats and midget submarines in the Persian Gulf <clears throat> could be eliminated through pinpoint strikes, as could our army artillery batteries along the Strait of Hormuz. Through such decisive action, the U.S., and its allies could help Iranians bring the popular uprising of 2009 to a fitting conclusion, close quote. You know, just a few bombing runs, right? You know, the old surgical strike routine? Uh, Choksi would not just take out Iran's nuclear enrichment program, but other production facilities and Revolutionary Guard and Basij bases that are scattered all over the country and most especially throughout Tehran itself. As well, he would also take out a variety of other military installations. Uh, Choksi, by the way, was very kind to spare the Iranian Air Force, which has 30 or so bases in Iran from which they could launch bombing campaigns against Saudi Arabian oil facilities after such an American strike. Something tells me that the Iranian people who are bound to suffer significant casualties in this massive and geographically dispersed bombing campaign would not see this as the liberation. He proposes instead, it would seem to me, they would rally around the regime in a burst of Iranian nationalism, uh, which we all understand to be the case, which is to say you scratch an Iranian and what do you get? A nationalist. So the passion and the stridency of these calls from the US and from the Israeli right wing and from the so-called Zionist lobby of evangelical Christians um, has been markedly escalated with the release of the new International Atomic Energy Report on Iran as of November 8th, 2011. The summary of this report concluded, and I wish to read the summary to you, quote, while the agency continues to verify the non-diversion of declared nuclear material at the nuclear facilities declared by Iran under its safeguards agreement, as Iran is not providing the necessary cooperation, including by not implementing its additional protocol, the agency is unable to provide credible assurance about the absence of undeclared nuclear material and activities in Iran, and therefore, to conclude that all nuclear material in Iran is intended for peaceful activities. Furthermore, we're still quoting, the agency has serious concerns regarding possible military dimensions to Iran's nuclear program. After assessing carefully and critically, the extensive information indicates that Iran has carried out activities relevant to the development of a nuclear explosive device. The information also indicates that prior to the end of 2003, these activities took place under, under a structured program and that some activities may still be going on. Sounds menacing, right? But a close reading of the report makes clear that the most menacing activity occurred before 2003 when the US National Intelligence Estimate concluded that Iran indeed had ended its nuclear well, uh, weapons development program. If you want to see a much more detailed critique of the International Atomic Energy Agency's report, go to the New Yorker blogs and see a blog by Seymour Hersh, H-E-R-S-H, because as you all know, if those of you know Cy, he's a guy from High Park who's become this uh, very prominent journalist in America. Uh, Cy Hersh is not a patsy. Cy Hersh is a very tough guy on the United States uh, and on Iran. Ehud Barak, Israel's defense minister, was on Charlie Rose's show on November 15, 2011. 
And Barack said that all the evidence pointed to Iran's developing a military nuclear capability. Charlie Rose then asked Barack if, if he were an Iranian leader, would he want to develop nuclear weapons? And Barack, of course, said, quote, probably, probably, close quote. Uh, he then pointed out, Barack then pointed out that Iran has many neighbors with nuclear weapons, which explains why Iran would want the deterrence of nukes. What Barack did not mention, however, was the additional fact that the United States occupies the countries to Iran's immediate west and to Iran's immediate east as well and has ships south of Iran in the Persian Gulf and nuclear weapons in the neighborhood. Barack, however, denied any intention of allowing Iran to fulfill their wish, as he said, just as it would have been suicidally claimed for the world to tolerate Syria or Gaddafi's developing nuclear weapons. If it is so easy to understand Iran's alleged desire to acquire nukes as a deterrent against the threats which it confronts, it should not be too difficult to understand a way to talk to Iran, to explore the ways in which it might be reassured that developing nuclear weapons would not be in its own best interest. The one guarantee that such, such talks would fail would be to persist in the threats and the hysteria now coming from Prime Minister Netanyahu and Defense Minister Barack and certain presidential hopefuls in the United States. What the United States does not need anytime soon is another war against another Islamic country. Negotiations, threat-free between equals, needs to be tried and soon. The one thing that the United States has not yet tried. Thank you very much. OK. Uh, good, uh, good evening. My name is Scott Hibbard um, uh, from DePaul University. Uh, I am going to be picking up where uh, Dr. Zonis left off. And before I do that, though, I'd like to thank our organizers for hosting this uh, panel and appreciate everyone coming out tonight. And um, I'm glad to be a part of it and happy to be in Hyde Park. Um, so again, let me uh, pick up where uh, Dr. Zonis left off, because uh, I really want to focus on you know, this, this changing rhetoric that we've seen and this increased uh, militancy in, in uh, the rhetoric, particularly within the American political um, uh, spectrum or within the American political system. Um, and I want to look at, you know, try to draw some of the assumptions that underlie it and look at, you know, the various, you know, options that America has for trying to, um, to deal with um, uh, Iran. And so in some respects, my, my talk is going to be a little bit more analytical, more um, kind of academic, if you will. But this is University of Chicago, so I figured it would, it would, uh, it would fit. Um, let me uh, begin then with uh, just kind of three observations. Um, uh, when I, as I've been watching the uh, you know the debates going on in Israel and the increased you know rhetoric uh, by uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, uh, Foreign Minister Ehud Barak um, or I guess not Foreign Minister Defense Minister Barak, uh, as well as uh, watching the uh, the uh, American presidential uh, debates and the Republican primary presidential debates uh, recently, um, I was really struck you know by this you know increased belligerency and uh, so um, as I as I think as I was listening to this, I was not thinking back to 2002. I was thinking back to 2007, 2008. Uh, because if you know how many of you recall this, but there was a real push to, at the end of the Bush administration uh, to do something about, um, about Iran. And uh, there was even an event hosted up um, at DePaul University by the DePaul Conservative Alliance, a kind of a neoconservative group. And uh, the title of the event was War with Iran? Question mark. Um, it was a very curious event, um, but but anyway, the, the bottom line was that um, that the the basic arguments were being laid out then. They're being laid out today. That Iran, Iran's on the verge of developing nuclear weapons. Um, that a nuclear armed Iran, from an American perspective, is simply unacceptable, either from a moral perspective or from a strategic perspective. And therefore, something must be done, including some kind of preemptive strike. I mean, that's the argument. That was the argument put out by the Bush administration in 2007, 2008, or elements of the Bush administration. And that's the same kind of argument that you're, that you're seeing um, you know, bending around now. Now, there's two assumptions to this that I find um, kind of curious. 
One is that the, um, the nuclear program that Iran has is, you know, um, has a military component to it. Um, and that assumption I actually buy. I mean, I don't know why they would be developing a nuclear program if they didn't have a military component. I mean, everyone else in their region has nuclear capabilities so, or, or nuclear weapons. I don't know why they would spend all the money if they weren't going to be producing nuclear weapons. But the second assumption, so I have no problems with the first assumption. It's the second assumption that's really problematic. And the second assumption that you that kind of lurks in the you know, in these debates is that the ideological nature of the Iranian regime means that if it has these weapons, it will use them, and it will use them in an offensive or first strike capability. And I find this really problematic. Um, I find this really problematic for a number of reasons, um, but we'll talk about a little bit um, about the, a little bit more about this later. But but this is the kind of in some respects the key assumption that justifies the preemptive strike, where I think the, uh, the, um, the arguments are just simply off base. So let me then turn to the second observation um, uh, as a way of kind of, as kind of prefatory, preface, prefacing my remarks. The second observation is that um, the, this idea that because of the, the nuclear, you know, aspiring nuclear capability of the Iranian regime and the nature of its, nature of, the, um, uh, nature of, its of its power is you know, bent on, you know, um, is bent on uh, some kind of first strike capability, therefore preemptive <clears throat> war ought to be undertaken. You know, that fell flat in 2007 and 2008, and it's falling flat today, I would argue. I hope it will, for many of the same reasons. Because as, you know, as uh, former Mossad director, um, uh, was, um, uh, Meyer Degen, was, was recently arguing that uh, a preemptive strike will not accomplish the ends. That what it will do is it'll set back Iran's you know nuclear you know program, but it will inflame the region. It will you know lead to region-wide war. It will greatly destabilize the region. It will uh, interrupt the flow of oil. It will raise the price of oil. It will you know, put, you know, put severe economic uh, uh, constraints upon the international economy at a time they can really at least afford it. So there, there's any number of reasons why this is a really ridiculous idea, and yet the question remains: Why is it still on the table? And this then leads to my third observation. Why are we still talking after we've, in some respects, dismissed this idea before? Why are we still talking about it? Why is it still part of the, the political discourse of American politics as well as Israeli politics? And I would argue that part of the reason why is that there, there really is no consensus on not just you know, what, the, you know, what the solution is to Iran, but there's really no consensus about what the nature of the problem is we're trying to solve. Um, and so when you look at the American political spectrum, uh, we, can't, we can't agree on what the problem is, therefore we can't agree on what, you know, what the solution ought to be. So what I want to do for the next you know, 10, 15 minutes is try to you know, pull this apart a little bit and look at some of the assumptions and in some respects try to figure out what it is or what's the problem that we're trying to solve here when we talk about U.S.-Iranian relations. So let me offer my take on the problem. And then we'll look at some of the various solutions and then we'll look at the kind of the neoconservative take and, and how that offers different solutions and see if we can kind of pull it into some kind of coherent whole at the end. So what is the nature of the problem? Well, let me begin again with my perspective. Uh, from my view, the issue is simple. We have a rising power of Iran in the Persian Gulf. And this is largely a problem of our own making. And by taking down Saddam Hussein and removing the Taliban in, in Afghanistan, we remove the two powers that have historically contained Iranian ambitions. And into this power vacuum, Iran has, you know, has, expand, has expanded. I mean, this is just this is the basic you know, dynamics. Um, now, this is extremely problematic for a number of reasons um, because it's upset the balance of power you know, in the region. And the region is strategically significant, in part because it sits on top of two-thirds of the world's proven reserves of, of oil. $30 trillion worth of oil. Um, and that is readily translated into economic power and hence into military power. So there's this, and of course, you know, everything runs on oil. So I mean, it's not just about oil, but it is largely about, <laughs> largely about oil. Um, so we can look at this, we can look at the, the challenge or the problem, if you will, from a largely strategic perspective, rising power of Iran, how, do, how, does, how does the region deal with it? How does the US deal with it? Um, but there is a twist, and I, and I don't want to diminish this twist. Uh, the twist, of course, is the ideological and religious dimension of the Iranian regime and the ideological and religious dimension of the rhetorics you know, within the West and the way in which it characterizes the Iranian regime. Um, and here, you, know, you can't, and I'm not an Iranian expert per se, I'm more of an American foreign policy specialist. And my other two colleagues will 
I'll be talking more about the internal dynamics within Iran, but, uh, but I think it's fair to say that you know, one of the defining features of the Iranian regime is its revolutionary Shias, Shia nationalism. I mean, that's just part of its identity and part of its raison d'etre. And it's also one of the things that, that sparks a great deal of fear within at least the Sunni order, you know, the Saudis, the Turks, the, uh, the Egyptians, uh, perhaps less so the Egyptians now, but, um, but definitely under, under the Mubarak regime. Um, and so there's, there is this confrontation, this ideological confrontation between you know, the status quo powers, which are largely Sunni, and this kind of revisionist power rising in the midst of the Persian Gulf, which is largely, which is defined by its Shia identity. Um, now, it, of course, it also, the Shia nationalism pits, you know, uh, pits you know, the Iran against the West and against Israel for a variety of reasons, but largely because we're affiliated with that Sunni order. Our you know, vested interests have been you know, tied to the Sunni order for, for many decades. Um, now, of course, there's a historical dimension to this as well, a lot of bad blood. But again, that ties into some of these religious and ideological issues. Um, the point is that when we look at the challenge of Iran, if we try to figure out what the problem is we're trying to solve, you know, it's largely a strategic issue of a rising power that's complicated by this ideological factor. Now, let me just give you an insight into my analysis. I'm basically making an argument that this is predominantly a strategic issue. And the ideology complicates factors, but it's a, it's a marginal issue. Um, when we start looking at the neoconservative perspective, they're going to switch it around. And they're basically going to make an argument that's fundamentally ideological and only, um, only relatedly uh, strategic. What then must be done? Right? <laughs> what can we do? Um, well, in some respects, um, again, for those of you who are uh, University of Chicago students, this is why you want to go to John Mearsheimer's class and absorb all the, all the, uh, all the material about you know, international relations. Because there's basically three ways in which one deals with a rising power. Right? And you look at history, um, right, you either accommodate it or engage it in some way or try to you know, kind of cultivate some, you know, some working relationship. Um, you try to contain it or you try to confront it. Those are basically the three options. Or, you know, to, to be fair, there's always you know, this you know, political science always gets these typologies, but it's always a little mix of, of both. Typologies are a little too static, but um, but you know, but those are kind of the three basic options, and you know, you're going to see some one of those options or you know, some combination of the above. So let me expand a little bit on that. When we talk about engaging, um, you know, Iran or cultivating some kind of accommodation or some kind of um, uh, or detente, if you will. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about putting everything on the on the table: historical grievances, um, you know, strategic interest, um, trying to find areas of common ground. You know, working with them on issues where we have you know conflicts of interest, right? And you know, there are many areas where there is common ground: stability in the region, free flow of oil, stability in Iraq. I mean, those things are you know, part of America's national security interests. Um, so there is a good argument that can be made about uh, about uh, for engagement, but it is going to there is a price to be paid. We have to drop the regime change rhetoric, and we do have to make accommodations. We can't dictate terms in the way that many in the United States would like. Um, now, if we're not going to uh, engage Iran or try to accommodate it, what's what are the options? Well, of course, one option is is military confrontation. I mean, we know what that is, and it's basically what uh, Dr. Zonis was just alluding to. You know, strategic strikes. Uh, actually, Cy Hirsch had a really interesting article in the New Yorker about, about back in 2007 or 2008. And one of the one of the issues that was on the agenda at the time was the use uh, during the during the Bush administration was the use of tactical nuclear weapons <clears throat> to remove or to get these you know go after these these bunkers that are deep under, underground. So, military option is one issue, which is enormously problematic. So, if you're not going to accommodate, you're not going to confront. Well, then how do you contain? And here you can look at you know three or four different um, ideas. One is you can try to isolate them diplomatically, which the U.S. has been trying to do both under the Bush administration and under the Obama administration. You can try to impose economic sanctions, which we are trying to step up at the moment. Uh, you can engage in covert operations, you know, espionage, uh, which is basically very you know, bleeding into the area of, of military confrontation. Um, and that's basically what the U.S. policy has been. Not willing to go to the edge of actual military confrontation, but basically engaging in all these efforts to try to contain Iranian regional ambitions, including um, uh, covert actions and, and espionage. And, and this is enormously problematic for any number of reasons, but uh, we can come back and talk about this in the, in the Q&A. Um, now, the, uh, the other panelists will have their own take on, on which of these preferred options are, 
or which of these options are preferable. Um, I would just make a very you know, brief comment here that um, you know, the military option really doesn't work for the reasons we alluded to earlier. But I would argue that the containment strategy is also flawed, that ultimately it will not work because Iran has oil and an enormous amount of natural gas. And Europe wants it, Russia wants it, China wants it. Therefore, the ability of the U.S. to try to you know, contain Iran you know, economically or isolate Iran, either economically or politically, is really not going to, fit, is not going to work. So now you're, you're basically back to this issue of covert operations, espionage, um, and some, some low-level military conflict. And I, again, I find that you know, problematic on any number of levels. But. So if, you, uh, if it seems so patently evident <laughs> what, the, you know, what the path forward should be, if you look at this kind of from a strategic analysis and look at the pros and the cons, and you know, um, if you are all persuaded by my, my rhetoric here, why then would people differ? Why would people continue to be arguing for a more robust or more militant uh, response? And here, I think it's important to get in the head of you know, the, the alternative perspective, you know, those that are, that are actually calling for, um, for military confrontation. Um, and here, I, I think I'd, I'd like to go back to the you know, traditional neoconservative perspective, um, because again, this is, you know, this is reflected in the contemporary political debates within the, within the uh, Republican Party. Um, and the traditional neoconservative perspective really does see this as first and foremost um, a ideological conflict. That the problem is not just that we have conflicts of interest, but the problem is that the nature of the Iranian regime is such that it's just simply intolerable that it have nuclear weapons, because again, there is this assumption that there will be first strike use, um, and therefore any option is legitimate, you know, including the military option. Uh, and here I'll just throw out a line from uh, the, the debate the other night where uh, Newt Gingrich was, um, was, was, uh, was you know, talking about the Iranian challenge. And he basically said that uh, uh, stopping regime change without war is the best option. Regime change with war is the second option, second preferable option. And then uh, I can't remember the third. And then the third uh, option was um, uh, you know um, stopping or, or stopping nuclear weapons with you know um, by you know by bombing them, and keeping the regime in power. Um, and I was I was struck that you know he threw that out, and Wolf Blitzer didn't call him on it and say. Um, but again, what's you know what's driving this? Well, what's driving this is, in some respects, again, the, you know this, I, this assumption about the you know the ideological nature of the regime. Um, so when we look at when we look at the neoconservative perspective, when we look at the Republican um, you know debates, we have to kind of ask ourselves what is the question or what is the problem that they're trying to solve? And we can look at this from one of two perspectives. Um, on one hand, we can look at it, you know, we can take their word at it that they're genuinely trying to, you know, to deal with a, you know, a, a rising power in, 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 the, um, in the region, and that they look at it very much akin to the Soviet Union or to Nazi Germany, where appeasement or accommodation is simply you know, impossible because the nature of the regime will preclude it from you know, dealing with you as a normal state. Um, and so that's what's in their, in their mind. I have, a, I have a problem with that, but, uh, but that's what's, what's driving their perspective. Um, a second you know, dimension in terms of what's the problem they're trying to solve is we could very simply argue that what they're the problem they're trying to solve is flagging political campaigns. Mm -hmm. We need to keep in mind that this is red meat on the campaign trail. And if you look at it right across the board, I mean, nobody was saying anything about accommodation, uh, whether it was you know Herman Cain or Rick Perry or, uh, or anybody. Um, you know, Michelle Bachman and Rick Santorum. I mean, they're all, and you can go you know across the you know across the board on YouTube. I mean, this is red meat. You know, for the Republican primaries that, uh, or for the for the Republican primary audience that they're, they're catering to, so now the, the kind of the punchline here is that this highlights what I see is, in some respects, a really deep problem within within the debate about American relations with with Iran, is that the hardliners in our society are reflective of the hardliners in the Israeli society, and they feed one another, and they and ironically they feed the hardliners in the Iranian community. And so part of, the, part of the, the problem that I think we need to solve as a society is how do you try to get away from you know, these hardline perspectives? How do you create an incentive to moderate both within the domestic political you know, community as well as, um, as well as within the international community? Uh, and this is what I see as the, as the real challenge. Um, so let me close with, um, with just one or two final comments on all of this. Um, ultimately, the real problem that I see, the real problem that I would, you know, would argue needs to be resolved is regional stability. 
Um, I mean, what's, what is the problem? Is you have a very fractured region, a very militarized region. And I don't see how more military confrontation is going to solve that. Um, I think that in some respects, the only way you're going to resolve this is through engagement. <coughs> Uh, and as a, a colleague of mine, you know, once said in, in a, in a or we used to give talks periodically together, and he always made the comment that the way out of Iraq is through Iran, right? You either engage Iran to get out of Iraq peacefully, or you, you, know, you go militarily through Iran and you know, end it violently. Um, we're pulling out of out of, out of um, Iraq, you know, at the end of this year, but it's not altogether clear what's going to come next. And I think that this is where America really needs to look at its long-term strategic interests. And the only way we're going to have stability in the region is by engaging the Iranians um, and engaging, engaging the other powers as well, the Turks and the, and the Egyptians and, and the Saudis, but, uh, but primarily the Iranians, because they're the ones, because uh, as many people have said, you, know, you, don't, you don't negotiate with your friends, you negotiate with your enemies. Um, and I really think this is the only, this is the only path um, toward a more stable region. Okay. So I want to leave it at that and uh, turn it over to the next panelist. The troubled history between Iran and the US has created this difficulty in just being able to address, as our speakers have said, what are the critical issues? What is the path? What is, where are we going with this negotiations? And the worst is that for Tehran, it views that the United States will always pursue some issue with the Islamic Republic. Maybe the issue today will be nuclear. Tomorrow it will be human rights violations. The next will be terrorist groups. And so the regime has decided, and this is a, from a very close meeting with uh, Ayatollah Khamenei when in 2002 with uh, the reformists in a meeting he, he actually mentioned that we have to pick the nuclear issue because it is the only issue that we can rally the whole nation around. We can actually, if we do not stand our ground on one point, the Americans, we'll move on to the next and next. And the only viable point that we can stand on is a nuclear issue. And as you have seen throughout the years, no political group in Iran, present, past, or future, will ever dismiss the inalienable right of Iran to nuclear energy. And therefore, because of that, Khamenei had predicted that, yes, we have to stick to this one point. And they've dragged as long as they can to, you know, to the, the small, or the, to the reservations from the reformists at that time that, no, we have to engage. We have to engage with the international community. And th th at this point, it's very important that, to mention that the supreme leader does have a great influence on how Iran operates its foreign policy. It dictates the, the route. It may send as Ahmadinejad or Khatami or Larijani or others to negotiate on his behalf. But at the end of the day, it is harmony that gives the green light or the red light. And this has to be understood. Who do you speak to if you're a United States government? Negotiate as much as you want with these officials. But at the end, it is harmony that says, go ahead. I don't feel like it. Maybe tomorrow. It is, this is a dilemma that the US is sitting on as well. So strategically, they picked on the nuclear issue. And for Iran government, Islamic government, its biggest fear and worry, as again has been mentioned, is regime change. It says that, you know, America has sugarcoated it with this and that, but at the end, it is aiming for regime change. And it would not stop until there is regime change. So how do we sort of slow this train towards regime change? And Iran has done what any sovereign self-interested regime would do, survive at any means possible. So they've taken multiple approaches to this. And I'm sorry that I hope I'm not repeating some of the points from previous speakers, but it is very important to see how Iran, as a colleague of mine said, is like America plays checkers in the Middle East. Iran plays chess. So, you know, they've been there for a long time. They know their neighbors. They're not new to the region. Before the Americans, the Brits came. Before that, the Russians came. Before that, you can go through the history. It is an old nation. And the leadership is not stupid. It may be, unfortunately, going towards a completely wrong direction. Yet we should not 
underestimate their intelligence in terms of how they are strategically moving forward with their policies. And this is, again, very important to acknowledge from the American perspective, not understanding that they're dealing with people who are actually very rational. They want to stay in power. It's very simple. Now, since we have to stick to the topic of the day today, I've decided to give you this overview, jump into the Arab Spring, because the Arab Spring has changed some things. The Middle East is not the same. I was in Egypt about a few months before in Tahrir Square, and I'm like, this country will never change. Look at these people. I mean, come on. Egyptians raising up. I would mention Hosni Mubarak, and people were like, don't say anything, you know. The, even the cab driver was afraid to tell me the truth about their society. That's my indicator, that there is really no freedom when a cab driver doesn't say anything bad about the regime. Unlike in Iran, which every cab driver and everybody is cursing the regime, of course, inside and outside. But at the moment, it's a little bit more difficult. So now let's touch on the Arab Spring. And I'm not going to go too much into it. I just want to say that what we are witnessing at this time is that there is, there is basically three elements that we have to watch out for that this new shakeup in the Middle East has, does have losers and winners. And we can make any projections on how this will develop, but I will give my little two cents to it. And that is that the, the regimes, the autocratic regimes that have dropped and the population that demanded this will aim to have what the Islamic revolution was embodied in. I'm not saying that it ended up being like that, but it was independence. Independence, having you know, elected officials that they can trust, having a, a sovereignty over their own policies, and having a better future, a better job, uh, into cronyism, into you know, um, corruption, and so forth. These same elements will not, enable these new, developing, really young, you know, transitional governments to tend towards two models. The most viable model for the region would be geared towards a Turkish model. One that is secular, yet it is rooted in Islamic belief, and is accepted by the West and also by the Islam, Islamic countries, Muslim countries. Turkey has developed this really interesting model, which again, it is, <laughs> The Party's roots are in the Islamic Brotherhood. And it's ironic because with the uh, rise of Turkey, you have a milking cow that basically financed a lot of the Islamic Brotherhood in the region, even though there is different doctrines within them, different directions of how they want to develop. But it's quite interesting, this correlation of rise of Turkey and also the influence of the Islamic Brotherhood. But so the Turkish model is really a plausible one. It's a Sunni government, Islam democratic in inverted commas. There's limitations, but really a good model so far. So far. And the other one would be chaotic. It would be interfighting ethnic, you know, between ethnic and uh, other groups. So these are the two projections. So Iran loses out on this. Nobody in the region is going to go and become an Islamic Republic, I assure you, in that sense, in the sense of the word. <coughs> However, Whereas Iran has lost in the political structure of the new developments in the region, it still has quite a formidable influence in the streets of the Arab world. Because the one most critical point that the Arab street is you know, so emotional about is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And you know, the sort of dominance of Israel and America's relationship with Israel. In all of these myths, we should not forget the Israeli component. So what will happen to Iran? What will happen to the United States with these new developments? And what are the options? Well, in terms of Iran, since, as I mentioned, is losing in the political, you know, sort of like ideological sense, it's playing a long haul game, especially at this time. The region is changing. Iran's uh, position, official position, was very supportive of the movements, except, of course, in Syria. And that lost a lot of credibility in the Arab world. So Iran, in that sense, will say, you know, regardless of what happens in the region, if we have a more independent, more sovereign, more Islamic regimes developing in the region, 
there is going to be a shift away from their allegiance towards the United States. So regardless, Iran will actually, in the long haul, have much better relations with the, with the regional countries, and the influence of America will be diminished. They won't have the decades-old linchpins in government, these autocratic regimes, and one by one, they're dropping. But Iran is waiting for the cherry on top, and that's when the Arab Spring reaches the Gulf. You know, they had a little spark in Bahrain, but if that spreads, the biggest alliance in the region, you know, Saudi, the GCC countries, and the United States, if that topples, the influence is unimaginable. So Iran has a very long view of the, what's happening in the region. America is sitting on a very difficult place because it has its values and its interests. In terms of its values, it's very clear that it would say democracy is fantastic, freedom of speech, go ahead, elect your officials. We want the people to rise and for, for this to develop towards a more liberal democracy. Yet its interest is on energy security in the region, stability of the region, and the interest of the security of Israel in the region. You have Egypt to the south of Israel, going whoppers, and now what are we going to do? <clears throat> What's going to be next? So this is quite a lot of questions. With Mubarak, you know, you're, you know, you, the devil you know is better to keep, you know, but now we don't know what's going to come out. Syria is in turmoil. America officially says, let's bring this Assad government down, but you bring in Alawi, Alawites down, and then you're going to replace them with what? What is there in Syria if the Alawite uh, regime falls? The Islamic Brotherhood. The Sunnis, extreme Sunnis. You're going to replace them with that. Then what do you think is going to happen on the flanks of Israel? So, and Turkey, relations with Israel is also diminishing. So United States in a very difficult situation at the moment. Do I go with my values? Do I go with my interests? Unfortunately, as we've always learned in the history of US, US foreign policy in the region, interest always prevails. Regardless, interest always prevails. I don't want to talk too much. Please, Mr. Moderator, Professor Zona, stop me when I need to be stopped. Thank you. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> but now we wrapped up this whole, uh, you know, this uh, sort of Arab Spring. What does it happen to the internal politics of Iran? What is Iran doing in the middle of all this? As I mentioned, they're playing the, whole, uh, the long haul game. So what are they doing in the short term? They've realized these uprisings where it's, wait a minute, didn't it start in our country? We started it. We started the Green Revolution. We started this whole Twitter and YouTube revolution. We began it. We didn't reap the rewards yet, but we started it. So the Islamic Republic, the government, it's now decided, wait a minute, the region is exploding. We saw this happening in our own country. We took out two thirds of our internal forces to basically stabilize the country. The high commander in the Basij, through a source of mine, mentioned this. Two thirds of the internal forces were rallied to control the crowds. They took out all their guns, in a sense. And I was actually there. I arrived the day after the elections. Not the best timing to arrive in Iran, but fantastic timing at the same time. It was quite incredible to see the energy. Unfortunately, it was also very disturbing. <clears throat> But what I wanted to allude to is that the, the regime has consolidated now power. It's like at any, it's hanging on, it's getting isolation, international isolation, sanctions. For the first time, the UN General Assembly voted overwhelmingly to sort of like pursue the human rights violations in Iran. That would never happen a few years ago. That you have Arab countries voting against Iran. You know, so th this is this is a completely change. This international isolation Iran is feeling is enormous. But my argument is that the regime has decided, okay, situation is bad. Nobody likes us. Let's close ranks. While they're closing ranks, is divisions. So there's two school of thought that says one is that there is divisions between Ahmadinejad government and the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei. And this division is really heated, and it actually made 
break this system down. One is pursuing more like nationalistic, republican like sort of approach. One wants to keep the theocracy and autocratic regime in place. And in the mix of all of this, the Basij, the Separ, and is also entangled in all of this. Quite a complex little pie. But there's another uh, thought that says, you know what, this whole wrangling between the two, to some extent is real, to some extent may not be real. Maybe the regime decided that it is important, more important, to shut down and remove any real opposition in Iran. And that was the leadership of the Green Movement, Musavi and Karubi and others. And they have silenced them. And they have created a sort of a false opposition within for the internal legitimacy of the government. Now, why do I say that? Well, there is also election here in Iran, but it's a parliamentary election. And for the Iranian regime, legitimacy is quite important. And as uh, my colleague Kaveh has mentioned, they do seek, there is some, the population believes that there is some sense of elections. But the regime has to test it, because after 2009, they've lost so much legitimacy. So they have to push something through this parliamentary elections in March 2nd, 2012, and bring out the crowds. How do we bring out the crowds? Create a division, create an opposition. In the same time, shut off the Green Movement once and for all. Musavi cannot, Musavi cannot exit his house in Iran. The voices are cut, cell phones to SMSs to internet to whatever is under control. Iran is a closed, is closed to the world. What better time to suppress? I have one minute. Anyway, so the point of all of this is that what options do we have? <laughs> and I will skip to this very quickly. And the solution to it is that if I was in the United States, <coughs> I would go through, a, basically to deal with Iran, you have to deal with two complete parallel packages. Deal with the nuclear issue through institutions which are already in place. United Nations, Security Council, or United Nations, uh, P5, plus Germany, as you've done before, and enhance with the IAEA, and go through the diplomatic channels on the negotiations through, for the nuclear matter. But parallel to this, there has to be a bilateral, comprehensive package of negotiations between United States and Iran directly. Without US and Iran solving their issues on a bilateral basis, on issues that range multiple for over decades, and then put the ones that deal with international and regional disputes on an international platform. Through this double track, if you can make headway on one and the other, if there's better relations in US and Iran, the nuclear should be solved. And I hope that in the near future, that you know, voice of reason will succeed and will have not the option of confrontation, because that will be just retarded. Thank you. Thank you very much to all our panelists. And the floor is now open for brief rebuttals or questions or statements. But Make it short because there are a lot of people in the room. Please, floor is open, ladies and gentlemen. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. A microphone. Uh, my question for Professor Hibbert. Um, you mentioned the neocon kind of view of ideology as being the salient kind of like the prism that they're looking uh, at Iran at. So, how can you describe uh, why the Democrats are also kind of following this line? The same, the same kind of inheriting the same policies that Bush, that the Bush administration. Uh, that's a good question. I think it gets back to uh, something we were alluding to earlier, or I think Kavi was mentioning, that um, there really isn't a much of a vision uh, within the Democratic Party as to what, um, you know, where to go with uh, the larger region. And uh, you know, I, think, I think part of it goes back to the fact that um, early on the Obama administration did try to reach out to, uh, to, the, um, uh, to the Iranians and was rebuffed. Um, and it's, it's kind of unfortunate. It's, you know, there was a moment when the Iranians reached out to us and we rebuffed them. There was a moment when we reached out to them that rebuffed us. Um, so we kind of fell back into a you know, kind of traditional pattern. And um, you know, quite frankly, you know, the ship of state is something that has an enormous amount of inertia. 
Um, and the last kind of, kind of comment on that is I would say that <clears throat> this is kind of a larger fault of the Democratic Party that, um, you know, love them or hate them, the neoconservatives have a vision for the region, and it's called the nine global hegemony. And it's not necessarily a vision, a vision that I think is actually operable, let alone, um, let alone uh, you know, uh, salutary. But at least they, you know, they've got a vision, whereas the, you know, the, um, uh, the Democrats tend to kind of fall back into the traditional pattern of American foreign policy. You know, we, we have the rhetorical commitment to human rights and you know, democracy and you know, uh, expending uh, democratic enlargement and uh, the expansion of capitalist uh, uh, integration. But when push comes to shove, we back the Saudis and we back the Israelis. And so it seems to me that what we really need and is, you know, it's a broader systemic, you know, if we can kind of have this in the larger spring, we really need a fundamental reevaluation of American foreign policy in the region. And, and Iran is just one component of that broader reevaluation. But, no, okay. Hello, and uh, I wanted to thank uh, Emad for finally bringing the discussion back to the Arab Spring because it seems like the nuclear issue of uh, Iran and the United States so distorts the discussions that almost the entire panel <coughs> forgot about the Arab Spring, and you finally wrapped it up uh, fairly nicely. Uh, one thing that I wanted to uh, ask you about the Arab Spring uh, and the potential of it is that not only just the realpolitik sense of it, which you covered, but I think in a way uh, why this whole thing is very threatening, both to Iran and the United States, is that it represents a paradigmatic paradigm, paradigm shift in terms of the analysis of the region that how we have been so focused on, uh, on the details and the minutia of the apparatus of state and the balance of power within them. And then all of a sudden, civil society comes in, 2009 in Iran, and boom, puts three and a half million people on the streets within 72 hours after the elections. And then what happens in Cairo and all that. I don't think anybody knows how to assess this new 800 pound gorilla in the internal politics of these countries in the Middle East. And they're all trying to kind of get a measure of it. And uh, I, uh, the only thing that I see so far from the Iranian government and the Office of the Supreme Leader is the national security paradigm approach to this. He is trying to solve essentially a political and a civil society issue through a national security paradigm. And I think that's bound to be a failure. Um, the other thing is that, in terms of the realpolitik aspect of what you talked about, uh, there has been 30 years of vested interest in politics uh, of Iran and the United States not engaging one another. And all these other countries, from Saudi Arabia to UAE to Israel, all are vested to have a check on the American policy towards Iran. So the bilateral issue that you talked about is not only, it's yes, I recommend it, it's feasible, but it also faces internal obstacles in this country in the sense that all these nations who don't want to take on Iran one-on-one, -on -one, they want to exploit this antagonistic relationship between Iran and the United States, and they want to have a check on that policy. How do you resolve that issue? Oh, boy. <laughs> well... I was trying not to go into that, but I will touch on that comment. It's a very good question and good elaboration. And um, most importantly, you're right. The relations between the United States and Iran have many, many moves in the background. And we have to acknowledge that. The peace dividend has to be increased. But to increase that, it will be stepping toes on the Saudis, the Israelis, even the Russians and the Chinese. You must understand, like, as the U.S. is losing out in Europe, the Russians and Chinese are gaining. So it should not be mistaken that the isolation of Iran and sanctions on Iran, it, and as uh, Kaveh has mentioned, Iran has 32 years of going around these sanctions. You know, when the tankers of the Bandar Abbas come out, the oil tankers, there are little ships that come, take the oil, and, you know, briefcase is full of crisps. Hundred dollar notes or tran transactions are like that. Put as many sanctions as you want. Those transactions are not going to stop. So you must understand that yes, there's vested interest both in the you know sort of like friends camp of Iran to keep the status quo, and those who view Iran as a threat. 
So not only do we have to worry about the Israeli dilemma, we have to worry about the Chinese dilemma. You know, when you go to the P5 meetings, and like, you know, you'll see like, you see the fighting in there, and the Chinese and the Russians are going to say, okay, fine, we water it down, we sign it, but nothing really changes. You know, they will make some big statements, big items that they'll stop. But we all know that the best mafiosa black market system that is being run is being run by the Iranian regime. And you must not forget the borders of Iran are controlled by the siege. Everything comes in and everything goes out has to go through the system. So as Khabar has said, the, the legitimate businessman of Iran has died. The sanction that isolation has created a <coughs> mafia-driven economy, a shadow economy, which is massive. And so the Saudis want to keep their own interests in place. <coughs> but the irony of all of this is that it is the gorilla that you mentioned, the 800-pound gorilla, there's a 400-pound elephant that is also around there. And that is basically the enormous potential between the US and Iran. If they actually sit down, they have so much common interest. You want to step out of Afghanistan and Iraq? Okay, we do it. You want to like, you, you want to, you know, get the oil security out of the Persian Gulf? Don't worry, everything will be fine. Our malls never close. I mean, what, what I'm saying is that like, it's, important, it's important to acknowledge that the like, U.S. has put the blindfolds on and it's been fed with completely... It's amazing how they're going against the national interest. If they realize what market they're messing up. You know, go to Iran. Economy may be bad, but I... You know, people don't like the government, but somehow everybody makes it too. You know, so it's... It's, it's irony, the, the space is closed, but somehow things trickle in. So in my, inter in my opinion, U.S. is losing out. It is Israel and Saudis and the rest, and the Chinese and the Russians. Basically the rest are enjoying their interests. So I hope one day we'll have a direct flight and we'll have a great time. <laughs> well, I want to add just one thing that hasn't been explicitly noted and that is, um, we've been talking as if there were rational actors in the United States. And there are rational actors, but their principal rational capabilities are directed towards getting reelected. And so we have to understand that with an election in November of 2012, and another very important voice in this discussion, which we haven't mentioned, is of course France. President Sarkozy is up for re-election in 2012. And so they are picking up really the lowest common denominator of uh, beating the drum, American nationalism, French nationalism, and beating up on the Iranians, which tends to be pretty popular with the publics of those countries as a way to secure, uh, in the case of Obama, re-election, the case of individual Republican candidates in this country winning the nomination, and certainly the same in uh, France with Sarkozy. So it's going to be a tough year to get any rational uh, foreign policy out of, uh, of these two countries. Can we let me just make a quick comment on that because um, I actually did have a section on the Arab Spring that I dropped out because I was just going on too long. But um, there was a very interesting article by uh, Rob Malley and Sanaga in the um, New York Review of Books a little while ago, a few weeks ago, about uh, counter revolution in the Arab Spring. And what I liked about it is, you know, he said that um, this ties in the first point of your, of your question that the Arab Spring thrusts new players into the dynamic, into you know, regional politics. And so now we have kind of three different levels of analysis that we need to kind of look at when we look at you know, the region. One is the you know, uh, society versus the, or the people versus the state. And then different factions within society against other factions within society. And then you still have that interstate dynamic. So you've got like, three levels of, of actors playing, you know, thing, playing out, or three different dynamics playing out. In some respects, the early era spring really was just the people versus the state. But now that we're getting into elections in places like Tunisia and, and, and Egypt, we'll see where it goes with, with uh, Syria and Libya, but um, now you're seeing the you know, different groups within, within, the, uh, within the societies now fighting out. But you also have, behind the scenes, states. And their you know, rivalries are being played out within these different societies. And so you have this strong counter-revolutionary push with the Saudis funding different groups and, and trying to play, you know, play um, 
uh, try to influence the outcome in the same way that the, you know, the, the Turkish you know, government is and the, and the Iranian government is. Um, now, on top of all that, and this is the second point I want to make, is that there is a certain amount of institutional inertia within the U.S., and this kind of back to Muhammad's earlier comment, that we've been dealing with militaries for so long that those are all our connections. And I see this definitely in Egypt. I mean, we don't really have connections to, definitely not the labor movement, let alone the youth movement, let alone you know, the Islamists. So, you know, and, and, you know, I mean, I think who's makes American foreign policy? Military's everywhere, State Department's not. So there's, there's this institutional inertia that's going to, that's still kind of dealing with things in a way that kind of fosters this, you know, Saudi-Iranian rivalry, Israel-Iranian rivalry, U.S.-Iranian rivalry. So even though the Arab Spring is broken, it's not really clear that, you know, the fundamental dynamics are going to change American foreign policy. Ladies and gentlemen, we're past our due date, so I would ask you to join me in thanking the panelists for their great and, and we learned a lot about uh, the uh, astounding complexity of the Iranian system and the difficulties of the foreign policy of the United States in relationship to that country. Thank you and good night.